Hello, my name is Toby Faber. I've been lecturing to the Art Society for quite a few years now, uh, but I've never lectured about the subject I'm going to be talking about today. Although it does sort of provide a tenuous, tenuous link between a couple of my subjects. But the reason I'm never going to be talking about this subject today on an actual lecture is because the object I'm going to be talking about, this magnificent Mark 9 EMG gramophone, is clearly far too large to transport around the country. So as I say, I'm going to just be talking about it a little bit, uh, but before you hear any more from me, uh, you probably should uh, hear a little bit of what it sounds like. You might feel you've heard enough of that for the time being. Uh, that was, as you probably gathered, When It's Milking Time in Switzerland, as sung by Cicely Courtenage, Comedienne, as it says on the label. Now, of course, I was worried about the copyright position on the extracts I was going to be playing to accompany today's talk, so I investigated that a bit. You'll be glad to know that the copyright in recordings runs out 50 years after they were made. Obviously, all the recordings I'm going to be playing you today on 78s, they are all well over. 50 years old. You also have to worry about the copyright in the underlying song, which generally lasts until 70 years after the composer's death. So I looked up uh, when it's milking time in Switzerland on the Performing Rights Society database, and I have to say it's not, it doesn't even figure there. So I think we can reasonably, be reasonably sure uh, that it is out of copyright. So what do we have here? Well, we have, as I say, a Mark IX EMG gramophone. Acquired by my grandfather, in 1929. And I suppose that's the first link to one of my other lecture subjects. That grandfather, Geoffrey Faber, was also the man who founded Faber and Faber, which is one of the subjects I talk about. Now in 1929, he was feeling briefly quite rich. And the reason he was feeling rich was because the dissolution of Faber and Guire at the beginning of that year had made him quite a lot of money. He lost most of it then in the stock market crash later on in the year. Nevertheless, in July, he was feeling quite rich. And in, on the 1st of July, he goes to dinner with the W.P. Watts, a literary agent uh, whose name lives on in the agency A.P. Watt. Uh, there had people, been people like, uh, I think, Conan Doyle's agent, for example. And he says, Mr. Watt gave me very nice wine and also let me hear his gramophone, which sounded wonderful. I know all this from my grandfather's diaries. And the next few, a few days later in my grandfather's diary, he goes to Wim Hof's, as he puts it, and listens to all their various gramophones, including the latest, as he puts it, electrical reproducer, which he, take, which he buys for £105, which is a vast sum when you think about it. And as I say, he was feeling rich at the time. Even so, £105, I mean, just to put that in context, he spent roughly the same on a car around the same time. And he says he was very lucky to get it because it had been sent for by the King of Spain. And I like that story. But also it makes me wonder about that price of £105. Because when you look at the actual advertisements of these gramophones at the time, they seem to have cost 16 guineas, 16 pounds and 16 shillings. So how do we get from there to the £105? Well, one answer, of course, is that my grandfather may have been slightly oversold. That King of Spain story does sound a little bit like a salesman's story. The other possibility, however, is his reference in that diary to electrical. Because, as you'll see for the advertisement, Standard Mark IX would have been a wind-up gramophone, whereas this one has always had its turntable driven by electricity, by an electric motor. And I suppose that might have been responsible for the greater price. 
So electrical from the point of view of the transmission on the motor, but absolutely not electrical uh, from the point of view of the acoustics, which is based entirely on the magnificent horn that you see here. And I'm just going to explain a little bit how it works uh, by starting, of course, at one end uh, with the needle. So we have the needles of these EMG gramophones, uh, which are different from the needles on standard gramophones in that they are fibre, uh, made in this case of bamboo. Now why this, why? Well because metal needles on these shellac records, uh, shellac of course quite a, uh, a soft substance really, metal need needles actually ground into the shellac records. So a shellac record played with a metal needle wouldn't last very long. EMG were very insistent therefore that to preserve your records you needed to use fibre needles, made as I say out of bamboo. Now the only problem with that is that that therefore means that it's the needle that wears down. And indeed these fibre needles need to be sharpened after every side. And to do that uh, you have uh, your little tool to do that. Uh, it's called uh, the Davy Cutter. Uh, and this one was indeed marketed by EMG. And you insert your needle into the hole in the Davy Cutter and just have a little slither sticking out. You can then cut, uh, shave off uh, that little end of the needle to leave yourself once again with a new fresh point on the needle. And this needle sits obviously on the end of the tone arm in the sound box. And as you can, and you can hear as I'm putting the needle back uh, into its little screw mounting there, uh, how uh, even the sound of doing that gets amplified as it comes out of the horn. Because that sound box essentially consists of the needle being connected to a diaphragm. A diaphragm at the end of the tone arm, which sets up sound waves within the tone arm that then go down the tone arm. It's a hollow metal tube, the tone arm, obviously articulated so it can move around with the record. And that tone arm then connects out into the horn uh, that you see here. Now, in the course of the 1920s, people had started to understand the physics of these horns slightly more. In particular, they started to understand two things. Firstly, that the length of this whole system, so from the diaphragm to the end of the horn, should ideally be nine foot. Nine foot in order to achieve the full range of reproduction that you needed from a record. The other thing people understood, uh, started to understand, was that uh, the radius of the horn uh, should increase exponentially. And that's why, of course, you get this splaying out of the horn. And that's important from the point of view of not establishing any unnecessary resonances within the horn. You don't want a particular frequency be favoured over another frequency of course when the gramophone is playing and therefore you need to have this exponential increase in the size of the horn. Now people had achieved these understandings in the course of the 1920s but it was the EMG company uh, which was the first really to translate that understanding into practice and they translated it into practice well in a series of models. The Mark 9 was one of the most popular, most popular and in particular they realised they could do it by constructing their horns in the way this one is out of layered paper. You can see how, it's, how they're achieving their length, essentially by having bends, uh, so that the whole system can be nine foot long. And then the, the horn itself is constructed out of this layered paper, so, which is A, easy to construct, and B, makes the horn relatively light. You can see how I can lift it off its mounting here. Uh, it's got a lovely brass mounting uh, by which it sits on the end of the tube that obviously the tone arm ends in. This gramophone has been in my family's possession, of course, since my grandfather bought it. Uh, it was inherited from him by my father, who had it sitting in his room in college for years and years and years. My father was a physicist at Cambridge, uh, and this gramophone undoubtedly inspired some of his physics. So much so that in 1984, he wrote a question that appeared in the Part 1b Advanced Physics Tripos, all about the physics of gramophone horns, in particular about that need for the radius to expand exponentially. I also did physics at Cambridge. Uh, a couple of years after that, I came across, uh, I was doing part 1b natural sciences, including advanced physics. I'm very glad I wasn't doing it in 1984, because I have to say, when I came across that question as a past, in a past paper, I found it absolutely impossible. And I was somebody who knew the gramophone. I still found it impossible. All I can do is apologise to anybody who came upon it at the time. And, and in due course, of course, uh, after my father's death, I took over this magnificent object. By which time, however, uh, the machine had suffered. In particular, the horn had suffered. This layered paper construction uh, is quite weak. 
and in particular there was a pretty standard weakness in these horns that they start to sag here at the bend in the horn and indeed this horn was sagging dreadfully by the time I took over the machine. I wasn't quite sure what to do about it but by then the internet uh, was in operation and of course I managed to find the ideal person on the internet to help me repair this gramophone. He was a man called Frank James who very sadly died last year uh, who had made uh, a number of things his life's work but one of them was understanding uh, EMG gramophones. He'd constructed a special mounting tool that you could put the horn on so you can then repair the layers of paper uh, to reconstruct it in the way you see here. He'd also got interested enough in the whole story of the company EMG to write a whole book about the EMG story, which he gave me a copy of. And that told me a few things actually. One of the most interesting things I think it told me was about the name. You kind of think when you hear that name EMG that it stands for something. Electromechanical gramophone perhaps, something like that. No, it actually stands for the initials of the man who started the company, Ellis Michael Ginn, he was called. He was apparently by all accounts a great salesman, and I can absolutely imagine him being the person who persuaded my grandfather uh, to spend £105 on this gramophone uh, back in 1929. On the other hand, he wasn't around in that company much longer, because as Frank's book told me, in 1930, uh, Mr Ginn was actually ousted from the company that he had founded, which bore his name. Uh, he went on to found another gramophone company called the Expert Gramophones, who made gramophones that I suppose are the only real rivals uh, to EMGs from that era. But then the rest of his life is a little bit sad, uh, and the person I particularly feel particularly sorry for in that whole story is actually uh, Mr Ginn's wife, Ethel, who realised uh, by the uh, end of the Second World War that as the demand for these machines started to uh, fall down, really there was only really demand for the needles to carry on playing them. And she was the person who would sit in the basement every day making more of these fibre needles, uh, which is a rather sad way, I think, for one's life to play out. Uh, but she did indeed make fibre needles, and I've still got a batch of them here, as you can see. So, obviously, I've got to play a little bit of this now, uh, just to demonstrate, really, what this machine, machine can do. I mentioned that the earlier forms that they, they, people really started to understand the physics of these horns in the course of the 1920s. Earlier machines were better for playing voice, reproducing the voice, and I suppose instruments that sound like the voice, so most obviously the violin, uh, which I suppose is the link to another of my lecture subjects, the Stradivarius violins. By the time these machines come along though, they really should be able to reproduce the entire orchestra. And that's obviously what I want to be able to demonstrate for you now. So I'm going to play out uh, just one side uh, of Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, uh, which I have ready to put on the machine on the machine here. They're still sought after EMG gramophones because, of course, there are recordings around today that are best played still on these EMGs. And so, what I'm going to play a little bit is just one side, and the, the, there are six altogether of. Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, Symphony Number no. 8, the Unfinished in B minor, as played by the London Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Sir Thomas Beecham. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm not going to be speaking any more after I put it on. I'm going to let it play out to the end of the side. All I'll do now is I'll apologise if you feel the sound doesn't quite uh, sound so good at the end of the side as it does at the beginning of the side. And that, of course, is because the needle wears down in the course of the side. So really, I, perhaps I should be stopping it halfway through to resharpen it. I'll also give a little demonstration of how you vary the volume on these machines. You vary the volume, of course, uh, simply by changing where the horn faces. 